Hello, everyone. Welcome to Girls Camp. It is I, Haley Rawl, your host. And today's episode is with one of my best friends in the whole world, Tanner Williams. Tanner and I had a friendship breakup, and it was in large part due to the church. Tanner came out as gay and left the church, and I was a progressive Mormon, dot, dot, dot. It led to a friendship breakup, which you will hear the story of. I have been trying to decide if I should give in to my feminine urge to disclaim, but I am going to add a couple of thoughts after editing the episode today. Thought number one, or I guess just disclaimer, is that there is more language than usual, so just heads up that way. The second thing I want to say is that Tanner and I really get into the progressive Mormon conversation in a much more no-holds-barred way than I think I have before on the podcast. I'm so appreciative of Tanner for speaking so openly and so straightforwardly to his thoughts and feelings about this. It is so important. And please listen. I think everybody should listen, but I also just want to let you know that we're talking about that in a pretty straightforward way. So you have that information moving forward. I did want to add one single caveat because I posted a reel today on Instagram about some progressive Mormon stuff, which I talked about on last week's episode. And there were a few people who commented. There are a lot of really good comments, but a few people commented and just kind of gave a reminder that some people kind of can't leave the church. And we could also talk about this forever. But I just wanted to make a caveat based on some of the things I said in this conversation that I understand that there are some people who want to leave the church but maybe find themselves in a situation where, for example, they rely on someone financially, like a spouse or a parent, and they're, they have to be physically in, mentally out. They have to kind of play in that progressive Mormon space because they actually have to kind of pretend to be Mormon in order to survive. I just, I want to make a note to the fact that it can be complicated and that there are factors at play for certain people in certain situations. And I don't know every situation or circumstance, but when I'm speaking about progressive Mormonism, especially in this context, I'm speaking of myself and who I was then, which is why I feel like I can speak really frankly about it. The one other thing I want to say about this is that I tried my best to center Tanner in this conversation as he should be centered, as the person who is queer and who suffered so immensely because of the church. And I say that just because, yes, I think there are nuances, and we get into that a little bit, how it can be complex in some ways. But I just don't think that queer people need to sit and listen to the justifications and the nuances, if that makes sense. Like, Someone like Tanner, I just, it's not his job to get into the weeds of these nuances. And so we didn't. And yeah, like I said, I'm sure I didn't do it perfectly, but I really wanted to center him and his message and his experience with all of this. And that's what I tried to do. I really hope you listen. I'm so glad you're here. So glad Tanner shared. I love you all. And here is the conversation with Tanner. And I am joined. By my oldest, longest, best friend. <laughs> I thought about my intro, too, like, <laughs> in the shower this morning. Like, what I was going to say. My, like, eternal wife. Like, my last shot at the Literally, celestial kingdom. How do we sum it up? I I mean, we're going to really fucking try. Yeah, we're going to yeah. try. It feels like... It feels like so many things. First of all, I've been thinking, what would third grade Haley and Tanner think about us now. I know. I also was like, oh, I wonder if the like preview photo of the episode has to be me and you hosting as MCs the sixth grade awards. Do you have it? In my gold satin shirt from Burlington Coat Factory. Do you remember? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Thank God you reminded me because I was also laying in bed last night running through like the amount of memories and inside jokes. Literally, it's just our whole lives. No, totally. We have been friends since... The third grade. Almost on 20 years. So we realizing. were eight years old. You asked me to be your girlfriend in the third grade. We'll do it again. 
<laughs> I'm actually planning on doing it during this episode. <laughs> you have to write it on the note. Circle yes or no. Yep. Do you remember that so vividly? Or or is it just my retelling that you've remembered? Because that's I think it's a the core retelling. memory for me. Of me asking you. you Didn't walking, I hide behind the snow? You're walking barrier? down the hill from Rock Canyon. Oh, and <laughs> I'm jump roping you. You're with Nate Sherman. You give Nate the note. Nate runs the note to me. You sprint to the playground and are hiding Peep. behind the hill. Peep over a Watching hill. me look at it. And I yeah. panicked, of course, because I was like, so I didn't know what to do. I think I just like gave the note back. <laughs> I really actually don't have a memory of, of what the of what the consensus was. With the note? Well, I mean, I know we didn't date. <laughs> I but think... I can't remember how it happened. Uh, because then we became best friends. Yeah. And also like rival enemies until an hour ago <laughs> yeah honestly true so what we're talking about today just so everyone has an idea we are going to be talking about your story not the whole thing yeah, I've also God. been thinking I, <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring you back to actually do the whole thing yeah but we're going to kind of be talking about your story in order to give enough context for our friendship breakup yeah 100 percent. and then kind of talk about because it was very church related in a lot of ways. Yeah. People who have listened from the beginning, I talked about you quite a bit, yeah, I feel like. Totally. And I talked about you on Mormon stories. There was the TikTok that you made specifically about our falling out. Yes. And that was a month prior to our reconciliation. And when was our reconciliation? How long has it I been? I think it was like probably like six to eight months ago. Time is so weird. Yeah, that's insane. It's really strange. But we reconciled. Yeah, we did. And here we are. Well, yeah, I feel like I was gonna, I was thinking like even when we reconciled, we didn't speak for three and a half years, right? Mm -hmm. I think. Not a word. Give or take. Not a fucking word. From speaking, I just want people to understand. You were like, you're, you're, my, you're my longest love. I loved you longer than anyone that I've not known since I like came out of the womb, but pretty close to coming out of the womb. You've been my best friend for my entire life and you were in all of my friend groups and then from all of that, us being involved in every single way to like absolutely nothing from one day to the next, it was like harder than any romantic breakup I've ever had. Like, one million percent. I like percent. got divorced from my family. Yes. The other night after you came over, because you came over a few nights ago, brought some wine. We had a fun, silly time. After you left, Bentley was like, you know, I feel like there's a part of you, me, that truly only comes alive with Tanner. Yeah. Which is so, That's so sweet. sweet. That's why I'm excited to talk about this. I do feel like, I don't know, we, we've done a lot of talking with each other about how we want to approach this topic. I feel like it's really important to talk about. Yeah. I think it's important to underscore like how meaningful and true our relationship was and to speak to especially the church element mm -hmm. and how absolutely destructive mm -hmm. ideologies can be. And like specific conversations kind of being our undoing. Like there was a lot of 100% church related things that yeah. Yeah, was our, was the dissolving dissolution. Dissolution? I think both work. Incredible. Yeah. Dissolution sounds really fun and really kind of political. <laughs> um, and just even before we get into it, like I, when we reconciled, I didn't feel like I was ready to do this. But even before we had our initial conversation, I was like, you know what? I hope we can get to a space where we can talk about this on Girls Camp because I was obviously secretly listening. <laughs> and I was and obviously were, secretly sending yeah, messages. Yeah, and you would um, stalk my account, right? Oh, yeah. I would stalk your Spotify. You would stalk my Spotify to get what I'd listen to. I would stalk to. your account too, but you don't post shit on Instagram. <laughs> That's true. So I would see like what you were working on every six months. And you're like, Meanwhile, I'm posting like mental health updates every two minutes. <laughs> so you probably knew a lot more about me. No, I really, I would like, like an old girlfriend, I would pop in every now and again. And yeah, I when you I like felt like you, you could. Oh, like yeah. I muted you on everything. Yeah, same. Yeah. Okay, well, great. Let's <laughs> get into this. Bottom line, I'm obsessed that we're doing this. I me too. really think that it's important because the church ruined our relationship yes and diet coke brought us back together <laughs> yes. cheers cheers to that cheers to actually our origin Honestly, story which is will's pit stop diet coke 44 ounce i kind of have been liking cans since i moved here that's incorrect but you I can't know, buy taste i know i know i know i'm still figuring out the lay of the land with my diet cokes right. i've been doing mcdonald's for right. drive through mm -hmm. which is pretty good yeah they but the ritual the is control different control of ice is is much harder at mcdonald's when you're not, you know, absolutely using the actual cup. um i won't dig too deep into the diet coke thing but i will say that my issue here is I'm usually with the girls so i have to go through a drive-thru yeah. because i'm not about to buckle unbuckle buckle unbuckle 
buckle to go to 7-Eleven. And also, like, have a crackhead smack in the windows, like, you while they're percent. asking, like, where's Tanner? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Why don't you try your best mm-hmm. to give some context to what your religious upbringing was like? What kind of Mormon yeah. were you? Similar to Jenna Jarvis. I think this is one of my most informative things. Crippling OCD uh, in the form of scrupulosity. Mm-hmm. Um, very scrupulous kid. But all around, very devout family, like 100% nuclear family. My dad is a singles ward bishop for like eight years. My mom was eventually in Motab. Five kids. I was the youngest of all of them. Very devout. We lived a block north of the temple. I was born in that house. My mom still lives there. Basically as orthodox as you possibly could be. Yeah. Very, very, very typical picture of a Mormon yeah. family. Let's talk about the scrupulosity thing. Yeah. I was remembering, I think maybe this is a good anecdote for that. In fourth grade, whenever we were taking tests, you would like cover your mm-hmm. face yep. because you were panicked that you were going to cheat. Yep. Right? Yeah. And I was just remembering me watching that as a kid and just being like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. Like, whoa, like chill. More yeah. just like tan, like it's fine. But realizing, obviously, neither of us had the tools or resources as nine year olds to understand, but realizing how deep that was for you and how yeah. like torturous that probably yeah, felt. Yeah, 100%. Because you felt like your brain was convincing you you were cheating if you even like looked around the room. Right. And like none of the like slobbery, like butthead kids that I was sitting next to, I would have ever, ever cheated off of because I was a smart kid. Another origin. We would always compare DRPs. That's what I'm saying about our love hate relationship. We've always had this deeply competitive, super competitive, both like academic and school. Being, both wanting like, to be on Disney Channel. Both wanting to be on D- Disney you Channel. Beat I got me out of way that. closer. <laughs> But my DRP score, I think, was a little better. I don't know. I still am not convinced. Um, but no, I I remember like my yeah my scrupulosity hit really hard in fourth grade, and it was all based off of if I happen to see something else that I'm cheating and I need to confess and like I need to if I see out of my periphery a piece of white across the entire room, then I've cheated and I need to disclose this because of a confession complex. If I don't tell Mr. Cox that like I saw an uppercase B on somebody's thing, then like I was cheating and therefore wasn't worthy to go to the church, take the sacrament. And therefore in 25 years when I get married, my marriage would be null and void because like it would have been a lie. No. And you really were thinking that way. No, I really was thinking that way. as a young kid. Yeah. 100%. Like fourth grade. Yeah. I would go to a jazz game. That was the only place I ever saw alcohol in my entire life. The beer cups. I would convince myself that the people walking above the aisle into the like box suites would have spilled something. So I would like tell myself that like something touched my arm and it was probably beer. And if like beer can diffuse into your skin, like lotion can or like a topical ointment can, then like I've ingested that. And therefore I have ingested alcohol and therefore have to tell my mom and dad and Bishop that I've ingested alcohol. You've and I'm like seven. Yeah telling myself that I'd like drank beer oh, it's, <laughs> which is like I would have drank IPAs then too. <laughs> <laughs> you should have been it's so interesting like hearing you talk about it I haven't like dwelled on that in a while how smart you are and how irrational that is also you were a kid but still it just speaks to the power of OCD married to Mormonism yeah, and totally. how incredibly powerful that is because yeah like something brushing my arm which didn't even happen like i would tell like it was just so so full of like the dogmatic rhetoric yeah and, like fear of death and hellfire yeah that my mind would go to like the nth degree in order to protect myself from maybe potentially being guilty and it was so exhausting so exhausting And like how my therapist at BYU who like diagnosed me with Mm. this kind of phrased it, it was basically like an absolute inability to forgive yourself for any sort of small humanoid infraction. Mm. Like the things I'm doing, it's like, oh, if you see whatever, something that you like didn't want to see on Instagram, instead of being like, oh, I'm an artist, I work, this is when I like wasn't looking nudity and like thought it was like such a crazy idea. If I was like looking at a publication that I wanted to be published in for my work, I would be like, oh, you know what? Like I just saw that tit. My intention 
deep down was to go see this tit mm. and I wasn't there to look at art. I wasn't there because I saw this painting of a Rubik's cube or something that I really liked how it was deep down. I knew that this potentially could have been there. I left this like crazy irrational space of like, I have ingested beer cause I like started to understand how crazy that was, but then it just transitioned into like, I never could trust my intentions with yeah. any choice. And that's up until after my mission, literally until I left the church yeah. five or six years ago, that literally my mental health became manageable. So and wild. It was like literally black and white of like leaving the church and being like, oh my God, wait, my mental illness is like 90% cured. Yeah. Literally. Ooh, I can't wait to talk about that. I'm therapizing you a little bit, but I've Therapize never me, connected the dots with the scrupulosity thing. How tied it seems to you to convincing yourself that you're bad. I feel like a lot of people kind of do the opposite thing. Like, oh, they, like, you give s- themselves the benefit yes, of the doubt. Yes, you stumble across something, you have the opposite reaction of like, but it's okay, like I wasn't trying, but you seemed committed almost to like, no, I'm yeah. a bad person. Yeah. I was trying to do this. Totally. I wanted to see nudity, even though it was on accident. And yeah. to me, again, that just speaks to the really dangerous rhetorics too of natural man and deep down you know if you let your natural self just be that's a bad person who's going to make bad decisions totally and also like it completely disrupted any sort of ability to trust myself or lean into any sort of intuition or to be like no i have something special like i'm a special person i have good traits i'm gonna choose what I feel like is correct for me or for the situation or for my friends because I'm a good person. I just always, yeah, like natural man, LOL, natural they. Um, (laughs) The natural they them um, of it all. (laughs) The natural they them of it all. That might be a good title. (laughs) That is a good title. But yeah, I just like, I actually, funny enough, we've been talking about this recently. Like I feel like for the first time in my life I've ever I'm allowed to like follow my intuition Mm. with my body, with my decisions. I'm allowed to like listen to my gut because I'm God. I'm the one that I can trust. And having all these rules and regulations based off of obviously like the fear mongering of Mormonism just stopped me from being able to like listen to myself and to my body and to my tensions. There's so, I don't know no, where is, we are right this now. This is so I'm just, great. Like, thinking I about think, where the structure no, of this conversation I is going. I think it sets it up really well to kind of just set the stage for like what your journey was like and what was happening in your brain and in your soul. Let's fast forward to teenage years. We've kind of spoken to that as well, but you know, you were had scrupulosity as a kid. You didn't know what it was. I feel like the teenage years, I'm curious where the queerness comes to play in all of this, because I think that's obviously a huge part of the story too. And maybe, I mean, we've spoken about this before. I think that was still at play as younger than that too, but I feel like maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, that's where that kind of started to be more of a presence for you. Yeah. I really have known that I was a queer person always. I always knew I was a queer person, but I feel like it really came to the forefront of how I like portrayed myself in middle school and high school. And I think there was a lot of pent up repression and anxiety that due to being closeted in the church in like seventh, eighth grade really caused me to be like kind of this volatile person. Mm, Um, Because of the hidingness of it? Yeah, totally. I mean, you knew me. I was like, I'm still so crazy, so loud, so much energy, but like I was a bottle rocket. There was no source of outlets for me. And I've kind of come to understand that a lot of that was due to this like really intense secret and this inability to ever just fully be myself. And I think that that kind of just like made me this hypercharged, like sometimes accidentally violent. I threw a wiffle ball at Harley's face <laughs> and like I blamed it on my brother dying <laughs> to get out of it with her dad. So I was like, I fucking chucked a wiffle ball at bitch's face. <laughs> but yes, I remember that. I remember that you had a lot of pent up stuff. Yeah. And it's so sad to think back and just be like, what if you could have just like been yourself? Totally. And like we had the best time. It was so fun growing up with you. And I feel like we had so much fun and we we were just like seizing life. We just, we wanted to do everything and we did everything and it was so fun. But like, and I mean, obviously that's coming from me who wasn't hiding a secret like that, but 
I guess I'm just saying that not to be like, oh, what a sad childhood, but like so sad that that was. It could have been so much richer. Exactly. And we could have been like the sisters that we are now. Exactly. And like we could have been in our underwear, like talking about JT Ramel, who I was already <laughs> thinking of at the same time you were dating. Um, <laughs> speaking of the other Rambles, we Jenna. We could have been in love with the same boys, which we were. I've so fallen we in love with. About. I mean, yeah, the like hot jocks of our high school. Like, wow, so unique of the closeted faggot and like the hot skinny girl to fall in love with. <laughs> that is our ultimate dynamic is like you were hot girl and I was token fag and I kind of love it. I actually do love it. Had I been able to be like full token fag, I think actually might have started our own cult inside of Provo I and perhaps I think we it. would have been too powerful. <laughs> totally. Like we really might have been too powerful. <laughs> totally. <laughs> because I was also like popular girly, but you made me cool and different. And you and made you me were, popular. And you were always... <laughs> But you kept me in check. Like, totally. you would be like, bitch, you're basic as hell. Like, bitch, those ballet flats, kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, I'm taking you to DI and buy me, like, crazy button-ups and, like, help me, like, crop them. Crop, crop. The midriff to Melody, your mom, eternally <laughs> hates me because I taught you what midriff was. No, my mom's <laughs> actually so obsessed with you. It's so cute. Oh, I haven't seen her in so I long. know. She's always, like... I didn't tell you this when we got here. She's like, have you seen Tanner yet? Oh, she cute. like loves uh, I notoriously had a crush on your mom also. I've always loved a MILF. You know this, that my yeah. family would sing, Haley's mom has got it going yeah. on and shame me as a child for like <laughs> literally wanting to doink your mom. Because <laughs> my mom was like, the, would come your in for like. Your mom's so hot. Yeah, and your mom is, is the so only hot. like hot young and person who had any sort of so like style <laughs> that actually inhabited Provo, Utah. Yeah. Melody's a MILF. 100%. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Okay, the queerness. <laughs> <laughs> this Which, is what I was scared of, is this absolute chaotic rendition. I love it. Rendition. I want it to be a chaotic rendition. Okay. The queerness in high school, even from my side of the story, I think your your queerness was always this kind of like elephant in the room. Totally. We were so close. And, and I just couldn't. Like, yes. Like, what could I possibly have exactly. said? Like, we were both deeply believing. A hundred percent. And even, like, we were the edgy Mormons in our school. Like, we would say shit. Actually, when you were talking about, like, swearing on your story yes. the other day, we were. We were, like, the cool kids. I feel like we said it's, fuck a lot in we high school. Say which fuck is, like, kind of crazy a no, little bit No, it's kind me. of incredible. <laughs> yeah, like, like, I feel like there was a phase, like, a junior year phase. Yeah, I was going to say, we were, like, walking out of Miss Van Orden's, like, <laughs> yes. room and being, like, fuck that bitch. Not about her, but about... <laughs> X, Y, and Z. <laughs> yeah, beep, beep, and yeah. beep. One thing I'm going to post, so I'm going to give quick context, is <clears throat> the absolutely groundbreaking piece of satirical art. Oh, there's That two. was the parodying deco. Mm -hmm. Basically, all the famous dancing on the stars girls yes, were, were in our dance company. Yes, were on our Tim Few Jenna dance Johnson. company. And you and I were like, wait a second, why did they get to be so sexual? Oof. And like... The soccer girls can't even roll up their shorts. Yeah. Rob Dahl. <laughs> Rob Dahl was a soccer coach. Also important context for the video because right. we do shout Rob Dahl out. Yeah. And so we did like a parody video, basically just dance, pretending to be well, the Deco Divas. Yeah. But then we shut down the talent show, which I showed somebody that I've been seeing. We watched him watch our performance on FaceTime. What and it was incredible. Think? We were literally, we might have already been too powerful <laughs> at Tiffany High School. We were so powerful we needed, I think that's part of what ultimately led to our break is like we needed like some yeah. humility in the <laughs> mix. <laughs> totally. But you were the star of that show also. That's true. You were absolutely. But now I'm a guest star in the show. <laughs> so <laughs> coming back around. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other contextual elements? Let's talk <clears throat> about the BYU days because yeah. you went on a mission. Mm-hmm. I also went on a mission. Mm -hmm. There was the missions and then we both went to BYU mm -hmm. and the BYU chapter of things, which I've also spoken about on this podcast, that for me was, I mean, I, I, especially between like you and I and how it relates to like our journey as friends, there wasn't really like questioning of the church. We were kind of edgy to your point. We were swearing and pushing boundaries maybe, but I feel like both of us were just like, Mormon. Deeply devout still. Yes. Yeah. Like I post this like high school space where we were kind of like, I remember being like, I'm not going to go to BYU. And my mom being like, we will be so disappointed in you. I didn't know she like, said turning that. Turning onto Canyon Road, literally. And I was like, 
okay, bitch, what? And then I was watching conference, had this like big come to Jesus. I was like, yeah, no more swearing. Like I'm going on a mission. I'm going to BYU. This is the true church. And then from that point on, basically until I came to the crux of deciding of living a true life or living like a self-hatred life inside of folklore that is equivalent to the Berenstein Bears, <laughs> that is the Mormon church, my favorite stand-up comedian. Um, <laughs> heard that one the berenstein bears i mean like it's berenstein bears adjacent absolutely um axillary um god what were we even talking about oh we we're just deeply devout we yeah. would even host kind of like friendship devotionals do you remember we would have like oh, yeah, study like hymns. intentional like we would all get together like share a scripture share a thought uh, maybe talk about occasionally like a concern would come up right but it was still never in this like progressive mormon space it was definitely not in this cherry picking space we were following every rule yeah like through and through yeah like, i wasn't looking at porn i couldn't break rules and obviously you didn't have the same experience with the scrupulosity but like we were like quote unquote good devout mormon kids who were i remember i used this in a text to my mom in high school to like stay out later i was like i'm not being good for you like i'm being good for me and then mm. basically i didn't have a curfew for the rest of my life which is a really really good study of semantics yeah great but um we were like being true pure whatever like for ourselves yeah and i think point. we both have the personality too where like it's so funny now on this side of it how that is able to actually express itself without totally. those confines. But it's interesting how within those confines, I think people with personalities like us, it's kind of like, okay, well, I guess this is the thing to be the best at. And I guess this yeah. is the thing to like excel at. I guess this is the thing. And so I think as we aged and yeah, left high school, we kind of had our fun in a sense. I mean, h hardly in any you know but we were a little rebellious but then it was like oh, okay this is now what we do like yeah. we're gonna be fucking good missionaries yeah totally like we're gonna be leaders on the mission like we're going to do the things and do them well totally i think after the mission i'm curious how you characterize this time because after the mission we fell right back in stride oh also i want to mention that i was dating jt before he left on his mission and I remember distinctly right. thinking, Which I had already left. Yes, you'd already left because I remember the where I was in my car and I was like, I do not miss JT nearly as fucking much as I miss Dan. Oh, <laughs> like, so cute. Because we also had to, we were separate for yeah. those two years. And totally. I remember just being like, oh my gosh, like I missed you so much. I feel like we fell right back into stride. But post-mission, I almost immediately got married. Yeah. It was very quickly that we found ourselves in a friend group where it was like three or four couples. Oh, it you. was nine couples and me, which is like so sad because like I would have just had a boyfriend too. Totally. Like, would I have been able to? And also like none of us should have been married yet either. 100% <laughs> <laughs> yeah. illegal. 10,000% illegal. But yeah, this is an interesting time because here's where we get into like the actually coming out that then leads to what hurt us so much. Yeah. And I think even the tension that started then, because I even remember like when I married Bentley, I feel like that was kind of a weird hard time for us. And I feel like there was a, and I think a lot of it was just like change and things like that. I don't think there was anything so overtly happening besides just like life changes where before we had been kind of so in stride yeah. with life. But I do kind of remember feeling like, like a little bit of almost you as like an older sibling being like, are you really marrying this person that you like just met? Kind of a protectiveness yeah. from you. I don't know what was going through your head at the time, but I do remember feeling a little bit that way. That's actually so interesting because thinking about a relationship, I, you know that I have the dumbest, most useless memory for like <laughs> what you were wearing, like what color of pants you were wearing at said date. Yeah. But I actually, that's not something that I really? think about. And maybe it's because I came to love Bentley so much. Yeah. And like we and became so friends. Yeah. That like maybe that time has kind of vanished, but like I've always been protective of you and I've always been like, do not fuck with my girl. Yeah. Like, this is my baby. Yeah. Um, and like my sister, but I, that's funny enough. That's not like a big chapter for me. I remember being like, okay, like you wrote this bitch like one letter, like you're <laughs> going to be sealed to him for a time in all eternity. Like Jesus motherfucking H Christ, honey. <laughs> but like, 
he just fell and tried with the rest of our friend group and I had known him since high school. That's funny. I don't ever think of yeah. that as like a competition. Also, I guess like so quickly we like all became married to each other. Totally. Like actually kind of felt that way. No, yeah. Like literally everyone at the orphanage got married to yeah, each other. No, yeah. like I honestly feel like during that phase of my life, I saw you like p- probably even sometimes more than Bentley. Well, I think we like also, I like became the sub husband. Yes. I was always the best friend, but like me and you kind of were like emotionally codependent. Yes. Probably at its peak was when you were married with Bentley at the ho- on the house on like third South. Yeah. And he was traveling a lot. Yeah. And we would spend like f- six days a week with each other yeah. kind of like all day. Yeah. I-, I feel like that was just the time where we all kind of started to be like, shit's getting really weird. Totally. With the church. <laughs> totally. And that's when we were having those devotionals trying to move towards this progressivist Mormon thing. And we had friends who were Jackie had like kind of started leaving before us. Yeah. Clark has like kind of always been on his Buddhist thing, but we were all kind of at this tentative area where like none of us had really tried weed or like none of us had drank. We all kind of came to this point of like teetering, right? Like when's the shelf going to break? But without really any of y'all's breaking before mine did. Yes. And, and not to like claim any sort of first or anything. Well, it was different for you. <clears throat> totally. And you spoke to this so well when you went on Ash, Ash May's podcast, which I can link in the show notes too. But you said essentially what I can't even imagine how hurtful and isolating it would be that we were discussing a lot of things. And I don't know if this was before or after you came out. I think it was maybe even after, but I wonder if this came into play before you came out where there was all these discussions that were kind of like, Ooh, like ideologically These, like, interesting paths. Yeah. It was yeah. theoretical for us yeah. in a way that it wasn't theoretical for you because a huge the issue for all of us at the time was LGBTQ yeah. rights. Yeah. And the church had done the kids of gay parents can't get baptized and then gone back on it. Yep. There was a lot of things happening around that. And so we were talking about it a lot. None of us felt good about it, but we were all discussing it from a place As of a metaphorical. Yes. Yeah. Theoretical. We were in heterosexual temple marriages yeah yeah yeah. and so yikes it was yeah. Burr. scary <laughs> <laughs> terrifying heterosexual temple marriage <laughs> wait that should be like a slight like i mean it feels like a slight possible sexy yeah. way you could describe it you know i should have worn garments i wish i was wearing garments right just now. garments just gar- well yeah just garments 100 percent um <laughs> speaking of which i can't remember if i'm sure i sent you but i wore women's temple clothing with nothing and some, under. Uh, yeah, as like a slutty temple wife for Halloween. Um, let me just kind of take the reins to just yes. talk about like this yes, year go. of like coming out and then you chime in and then whatever, we'll talk about whatever that brings up. This actually is, I think, where kind of like chronology of timeline and like specific conversations come into play with me and you. So I'm a junior at BYU. I get a therapist who... If there is something out there, some energetic shift, that fucking therapist was sent to me from like a parallel universe because I went and sat in the fucking basement of the Wilk and was like, I'm bi. Like I signed up for a therapist and said like, I'm bi. Mm. And I went in and I just was so frustrated, so pent up. I knew I was queer my whole life, but I finally was like kind of coming into terms and I was like, I'm queer. Like what the fuck do I do? Like how the fuck does this make sense? And I'm like being like super explicit in the basement of the Wilk, just like, so angry. Mm. It, the reason I went into therapy is just like, I couldn't hold this in any longer. And nobody knew at this point, except everybody who's ever met me knew, which is so sad that that couldn't have been just like a normal, like, oh, hey, like, do you fuck guys? And I'd be like, oh, yeah. Like in any other context of any other part of the world, especially now. Yeah. Kids don't even come out these days. Did yeah. You know that? It's just like, it They're is. They're like, Ew, that's like so like. Millennial. <laughs> that's so millennial gauche to come out. It's like everyone's queer. And it's like, yeah, it's, yes, it's insane. <laughs> But I missed that by like two years. And now Honestly, I'm like such a, bummer. a chuggy boomer for having come <laughs> out. It's insane. To um, a BYU therapist nonetheless. Yes, 100%. But I remember being so open and frustrated and still fully believing at this point. And him matching my energy and being like, bitch, literally, would, these are like quotes from him. He'd be like, bitch, what the fuck are you talking about? God doesn't fucking want you to like sit here and hit yourself. You're by who fucking cares? And I was like deeply flabbergasted and I'm like you just said the F word at the age back yeah, well, <laughs> or, like, honestly the whoa yeah no because I just know that's not the experience of probably everyone else except for him yeah and I would just was like oh my god whoa like this person who is quote unquote believing I don't know if he was or not or if he was just like trying to stave kids away from suicide which he did at least in my like yeah. in my situation yeah thank god for him changed my life 100% but I remember being like okay I'm bye and I was going to therapy and then I moved 
we're actually in Culver City again <gasps> right now, which is where I was living when I came out to you, which we'll get to in five seconds. But I was living here with my sister and brother-in-law for three months between my junior and senior year of college. I'd been going to therapy. Things had been really rocky for me. And my sister comes up to me and she was like, hey, you're in therapy. You tell me everything, but you haven't told me anything about what's going on in therapy. And that was the first time I'd been. She was like, are you... She said, like, gender stuff that you're, like, thinking about or struggling with or whatever. I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm bi, but I'm still believing. I'm still going to be a Mormon, whatever. And that was a couple months before you came into town to visit me on the way to Europe to see Bentley. Mm -hmm. Um, So we were here for, like, 48 hours. Like, you stayed with me and Lindsay and Jared. And I had already been here for a couple months. And y'all had seen that I was, like, maybe being a little queer on my story and I was like, okay, I think I'm going to like come out to Hay. You're the first person I told other than Lindsay approaching me. You came out, we went to church, and then we went and got tacos, right? Didn't we go to sacrament meeting? I don't remember going to church. I thought we went to church. I know it was on a Sunday because we went to Guisados on a Sunday, and it was like a big deal for me. But I was really? like, Haley's in town, she's visiting. Like, I don't remember do going to church. I thought maybe. Or but maybe I do not. remember the tacos. Yeah, Guisados. Like, um, we were walking on the street, and I was like, hey, what? Like, you said, like, I think there's issues I was, with something in the church and I was, or I said, I'm having issues with the church and you were like, well, what issues? I think I was, like that, yeah, right? I was kind of like, you were kind of like putting like stuff the out bush, there totally. and I was like, well, what? Right. And then I was like, well, what? <laughs> and you? I was like, well, what you? <laughs> Literally, because we then later found out that you had kind of come out with an intention to ask me about this or, and that like frames it in kind of a crazy way. But like there had been conversations with our friends at, and back in Provo of maybe Tan, is ready, ready to, to talk about soon. it. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And so I came out to you and did I say I was bi? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I really did believe. And that's actually like it. People like didn't believe it and other gay people didn't believe it, which I understand the sentiment, but like it just gave me no room to just like have a, like yeah. second and to that understand felt what right was happening. At the time. And I like thought I was fucking in love with you for 5 billion years. Totally. And same with Bay. Totally. Same with all these other hot poetic girls with tumblers. But I, I mean, that just wasn't the same love. I mean, I was adored you all, but I like, totally. Well, so it's it, also it's like kind of confusing time. Yeah. I, I can imagine it can be confusing. Yeah. It's like you were my best friends and I had such a love for you. And the only way that I thought that I could love like a girl that way is through being in love with her. Where totally. I was like, the second that anything, like I, we, I dated other girls very briefly, the second the illusion of what I thought that girl was, mm. was broken, then it like all fell to pieces for me. Like Jesse told one singular joke about Red Riding Hood and a helium voice. And I was like, out. I remember one Boot. girl you went on a date with. I was like, how did they go? You're like, she got a really low ACT score. Shut up. Do you not remember <laughs> no. that? You took a girl out. By the way, you did like a Wait, gorgeous I charcuterie might... by the oh, You like I know planned exactly the most that, gorgeous date and we were all so excited. And like, how did it go? And you were like, yeah, like, no, it was like fine. I was like, no, like really, how did it go? And you're like, she had a really low ACT score. What if she's listening? She'll know charcuterie by the <laughs> only did the other one girl. We might need to bleep out the word <laughs> Charcuterie by the blank. <laughs> I'll bring up well, I did do multiple like, charcuteries in different locations with like tablecloths. There you go. <laughs> now a host of girls are wondering if Literally, their ACT score was we're enough. low. It can compare it. No, yeah. but the point is like you didn't actually feel that way. Like no. you just didn't jive. And totally. so that was like the way it seems like it was. It was I, that illusion popping. I was explaining popping. totally. Yeah. It's not like you actually are judging people by ACT. I mean, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, mm. If it's lower than what I got, then you're dumb. <laughs> but if it's what I got, then you're pretty dumb. <laughs> um, that's very funny. But yes, that's a, that's a great illustration. Because ultimately, like, I just like want to be in underwear, like, geeking about a JT on the bed with you and Bay. You know what I mean? We could have just shared all of those experiences as sisters. And I think that that's what, what that was. So anyway, I came out to you. We spent the rest of the day together. I went and got an ice cream cone and you took a picture of me and it was like a very formative moment for me and my face is fucking beaming. We were on Abbott like, Kinney. We Abbot got salt Kinney. and straw. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100% before it was passe. <laughs> um, pre-passe salt and straw. Yeah, it was cool back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I just remember feeling like, oh my fucking God. And we called our other like closest friends and we were standing in the aisle and they were like, so like what's going on? And there was friends were on speaker and I said, I'm just standing in front of the DiGiorno's thinking about my DiGiorno. Do you remember? 
And that's how I came out to them as like being queer was the journey. But I was still a Mormon, right? I was still fully believing. I was really scared to move back to BYU because I'm an artist and the industry is out here. And I felt like I'd started making connections. And it felt like going back to Utah was like a really big step backwards, even though I had no plans of dating boys or leaving the church or anything. I was just like so insanely relieved to have something out in the open. And by out in the open, like eight people knew. And then we slowly started telling our other friends and friends of friends until like basically everyone knew except my mom, LOL. And at this point, I had just started my senior year at BYU. And I started talking to somebody and was a friend of a friend, really good connection. Very quickly fell for this boy and had like my first romantic interest in a boy. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were talking for a few weeks. He lived in a different state and he was going to come. And I, I think I was elder scorn president at this time. And I was actually really close to both my bishops. Oh wow. I, I had really about actually that. had really cool bishops, which like I 100% hate the church as an organization. I think it's laughable and it ruined my life in like a lot of ways. Yeah. Fair. But I really lucked out with like a few key people that could have been so much worse. Let's put it that mm. way. These are still like white upper class, cis hat men who Supporting perpetuate the, the patriarchy yeah. <laughs> and are complicit in teen suicides. But I got like the least awful of them. Mm. And I remember being like, hey, Bishop, whatever. Like I have this boy that I'm talking to. Like I'm going to date him. And he's like, well, what do you mean date? And I was like, I think just like how everybody else dates at BYU. Like we're not going to fuck. But like. Kiss, hold hands, whatever. go on dates. Yeah. yeah. And he was like, cool. And he was like, I don't know like how this is going to turn out for you. This gets me right into like the thick of the like worst part of I think probably my life, both health wise and everything that like mm. we were all very tied with. Once I started talking to this boy, I have never had a bigger moral dilemma ever come into my life at all. Whereas I like really thought the church was true and I really was falling. And it wasn't about just like falling for this boy. It was like, oh my God, like wait, this is what you've been fucking feeling for this is what you've offered JT. Let's yeah. just use him as a case study this yeah, entire episode. Yeah, yeah, like, please. This is how I try to explain it to heterosexual people in the church. Even your small, stupid crushes in middle school that are ultimately like not meaningful are still informing your future relationships in small ways because you're dating who you want to. Mm. So you're learning about relationships. You're learning about power dynamics. You're learning about attraction, about, about your pleasure, desires, desires yeah. totally. Whereas like the girls that I was dating, it was just like some like falsified version of reality. Mm. And it wasn't ultimately teaching me small lessons about my ultimate partner. So like I hit puberty and a lot of queer people vocalize this of like hitting puberty when you come out. You're basically as old as you are when you come out. So I'm like 23 at this point, basically feeling like a 13 year old in middle school mm -hmm. being like, oh my God, I have to date everyone. But at the same time, this is when all of our like hangs started because we came out to all this friend, to my close, our closest friends. We, I came out to <laughs> our closest friends and we started talking about like this ideal or like this ideological future in which like I came out and it was, was I dating boys? Was I marrying a boy? Yeah, to what was extent? I just being bisexual by word, but like still dating women? The church is true, blah, 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 blah. And when you came out here and it was just me and you and you were the only one who knew, we were sitting in my sister's courtyard and I was just like, what the fuck do I do, hell? Like I wanna date boys. And you were like, I, I really, I really don't think that God would want you to white knuckle this. I think God would want you to date boys, which is so lovely for you to have said, which ultimately hurt more later mm -hmm. when we broke up because, and we'll talk about this as well. Like I always held you perhaps to a higher standard mm -hmm. as than other friends or other Mormons in the church. And I think I was literally thinking about this while washing my hands, just barely in the bathroom. I, I think you were the close you're the closest person to me mm -hmm. throughout all of this. Yeah. And like you were my confidant and you were like my sounding board and you were a member and you were also kind of confused but you were still in and you were you're mar a married white cis hat woman and even though you're so smart there was also a threshold with like the ability that you had to relate to my situation and this led to like all of these focus groups where ultimately while this was all happening my like physical and mental health so bad just was dissolving i want to quickly make a note before i forget i think i've even up until hearing you say that not that i've resented you anymore but i think for so long i resented the fact that i felt like i was held to a different standard yeah. 
But now as I'm hearing you say that, like it's making me emotional because I feel like, oh, you just expected better of me because you like adored you. Yes. And not even for your sake, but because you're like this more so like this isn't Haley. This is amazing. It didn't make sense to me. How is this deeply intelligent and thoughtful girl who is watching me like toss and turn all night and like hearing how my body is shutting down yeah, and like how my digestive issues are starting and my breathing issues are starting. That was the disconnect that I think Mm. ultimately like was the, was the weirdest, craziest thing that um, just not understanding how you could be so close to me and love me so much and see how much better my life was, how I was free for the first time Mm. in the 15 years that you had known me and still were remaining in this church that's like lobbying to write legislation against trans healthcare. And like, that is basically, I mean, that is 100% misogynistic and xenophobic and racist. And, and that and ruined your life, which ruined my life. I saw closer than anyone. Yeah. yeah. Which ultimately, luckily I never had any like plans or whatever, but like I was I, like gotten to a very scary place. Mm, of, post like, friendship breakup or? No, post coming out and like post leaving. As it, you were like, trying to figure out if you were going to actually It was that year of just like, I thought I was going to hell all day, every day. It was only thing I could think of for like nine months. And I just was like, you're going to hell. You're going to hell if you do this. And it took the craziest toll on my body. In so much that I remember for the first time ever, you were all hanging out at Becca Neal's and you were like, Tan, come over. And I remember just like sitting against the foot of my bed, which is something that I've never done. I've never said that I would hang out in my entire life. And I just remember like feeling so sick and being like, I cannot move. I could not possibly be happy because like, if I do this, I'm going to hell. And if I don't do this, then like I'm living a lie the rest of my life. Yeah, And I'm miserable. And that just became so apparent in my life that I just like couldn't ignore it any longer. Mm. And once I, once this kind of year of metaphorical thing ended, thinking about this all day, every day, talking to all of our friends about it, I basically from one day to the next was like, oh my God not even thinking about like mountain meadows massacre or like any of the crazy doctrines, what's obviously you can sound yourself out of the church in 15 minutes online. But I was just like, Oh my God, like, of course I am able to love someone full year of thinking about this. And it just like one day it was like, Oh my God, that's so silly. It just kind of like clicked. That's differently. Like, that's raffle, bro. That's absolute LMAFAO. Of course I can feel this. Like, you can feel this. Everyone else in the church can feel this. How could this ever be wrong? And not even like, I don't believe in a God that like, blah, 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 would would do this. I was just like, oh my God, of course. That's so silly that I wouldn't be allowed to like do this thing with somebody that I want to and you can. It's deeply laughable. Yeah, it just flies in the face of any sort of reality. It's just like, literally why yeah <laughs> like totally. there's no no it's just absurd yeah totally yeah. which i then and then I've, i'll kind of wrap this up and that will bring us to like our final conversation then i want to hear what you were thinking and mm. what it was like watch not like what was it like watching me? but <laughs> well, like but like yeah, what was going through your mind because because basically at that point then february of 2019 still yeah. suffering from breathing issues for mind you three years my stomach and breathing Shut down for three years. Your body is just probably trying to catch up. 100%. Like literally was in fight or flight. How my doctors described it. They were like, you were in fight or flight for nine months all day, every day. And then they kind of deemed what I was experiencing, like 10 hour panic attacks all day, every day. And I was, and I stopped sleeping throughout this whole process. So therefore I started a bunch of meds, had crazy reactions to meds. They put me on like a bunch of psychotic, antipsychotics just because I, anyway, but this leads us to, me being out of the church, like newly out of the church, starting to swear, starting to be like, no, fuck the apostles. What the fuck? And this leads us to like a conversation we had at Jackie's house in the hot tub, me, you, Becca, and Jackie, where we were talking about apostles mm-hmm. and like um, their intentions and if they're good people or not. Mm. And how could they be good people if these ultimately are leading to kids killing themselves and Utah always has one of the highest teen suicide rates in the country every single year by like Mm -hmm. a factor of two or three of any other state. We had a conversation in which we were talking about the intentions of the general authorities. And I remember you, and this sounds so like, no, but like you couldn't handle it. And you started crying and like left the hot tub. And Becca was kind of on a similar page was somewhere between me and you and her journey of leaving. And so we were talking a little more openly. And then ultimately we had to get out of the hot tub and go, 
make sure I was make okay. sure you were okay. Whereas like once again, like we we're talking about like all these metaphoricals of like hellfire and damnation were always about me and the way we were talking about them. And I like really had just realized that I was a victim of the church, which we all fucking were 100%. But, but you sp- differently. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I remember just being like, why am I getting out of this hot tub in winter to like go make sure this bitch upstairs is okay mm. when she's like white, cis, ha- married, fine. And saw all of this just barely, like mm. saw all of this transpire. Like that's where a lot of my anger lied. It's just like, like the, I want to shake you part, which we've talked about. You've talked about a million times in the podcast. There's nothing you can say. There's nothing I could have fucking said. You watched me like go to the depths of mental hell and like be in scary places and how it felt to me. It was like, it's still not enough. So like what would be like killing myself? That's a thought that went to my, through my head a lot is like, do I have to kill myself in order for people near me to like actually understand? Yeah. To and prove that, how yeah. bad it actually was. Because no one will believe you. Yeah. And they can't because the church was meant and built for like white cis hat upper class men to justify who they fuck, to justify their power, to justify power over women, queers, and people of color. The church was built to make people like this justify your actions, to pat you on the back, to make you feel... And, like, you fell into that category. Totally. You know what I mean? Like, it was built for you and Bentley to be like, we are doing the right thing. Totally. And eventually you wanted to have kids. So it's like there's really nothing about your life that had anything against the church. At least, I mean, of course, you had your thoughts and stuff. Sure. Um, but, yeah. But I, nothing I think about you're totally your right. identity that goes against the grain of the church. It was built for you. And it is not for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in, totally. in so many different ways. And... So that was kind of like the first time that I was just like, wait, this is like not adding up, right? We go down the line. We're still friends. You moved to San Francisco. I moved to LA. I go visit you in San Francisco. We have a few tricky conversations. I'm out of the church at the time. We have that fight at that gorgeous park, me, you, and Becca. And basically you were just like how... I was kind of still tiptoeing around you about how I like shit talk to the church, but I don't even think the details of that conversation were important other than like it started putting me and you at odds with each other. We're no longer on the same page. I was out and my talking about the church was also hurtful to you as somebody shit talking anything anybody's a part of is hard. I remember us kind of being on that plane, right? I come back to Utah or I come back to LA. We're living our life. COVID is about to impend in like two months it was right before COVID it was right before COVID and I sent you a song and you were like hey because I had just posted there was a bunch of general conference stuff I think was it the gun stuff no I think that was a couple years later yeah I think that was a couple years later it was in February so it wouldn't have been general conference but it was something there was like some talk or something that that you posted about on that I like yeah and was like talking yeah about like how you can not be a member and be an ally to the queer community because that's antithetical and oxymoronic blah 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 blah. I sent you a song and you were like hey I need to talk to you about I can't like just respond to these like trivial like I can't just like be like hee hee this like grizzly bear song's fun when I'm seeing the shit that you're posting on your story and you were like I want to talk to you on the phone and I said like I didn't say sorry for anything I'd said to you or that I was sorry which is different from how our dynamic Mm -hmm. had been historically and I didn't apologize. So we end up jumping on a phone. And that was the last phone call we had for three and a half years. Yeah. Um, and I, we were talking. And as and I remember. Given I said crazy things. Yes. I also think we should maybe talk about the actual logistics of like some phrases in there. Yeah, sure. Okay. You Sorry, go. go for that. No, you say what you said. Um, I, or what you remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember being like. I hate the part of you that is a Mormon. Mm. I like hate it. There's no, I'm not like being sweet about it anymore. Like I, it's, I hate it, but I love you so much. I never want to lose you. I'm like willing to work through this. And I remember kind of like talking in this tone. We weren't very heated. You were a little bit like cry. Yeah. Yeah. Worked up, but we, we weren't, there wasn't like any, like, wasn't it? We weren't like yelling. It was like, yeah, yeah, totally. And then I thought that's all I said. But I was then told that I, by I think Bay, that I had said something along the lines, and you can correct me on this, please do, of like basically like a lot of the harm and like the stomach issues and breathing Mm. issues that I was having was like because of you and like putting that blame on you, which is insane. Mm. And that's 
obviously not true. I think probably what I meant by that, and I'm not justifying, that's an insane thing. I think I was like, this absolute inability to understand how people I love can still be in this church after they just watch my body shut down and me like get to the brink of destruction for a year. Like that's what's causing this thing. Like how, like this intense anger. And I remember we ended up, you were like, I can't talk about this right now. I gotta go. You were too worked up. You hung up. You texted me later and said like, I'm not okay. I'm sure you're not either. Like, I love you. And then the next day you texted me and you were like, there was a lot of other things I would, you, I would want to say, or there was a lot of things in that conversation that I would never say to anybody ever. Hmm. Like, let's cut our losses. I'll always love you. Goodbye. Crazy. That's kind of what I remember. And then you and never I'm texted sure me back there's... and we didn't talk for three and a half years. Yeah. It's crazy to like, I'm so glad we're doing this, actually. Yeah. <laughs> like, woo, this is so fun. Because also we did talk no, about like how we wanted we to talk totally about this. We totally have. And I actually am genuinely glad we're doing this because hearing you recap it again, which we kind of have done, it's crazy like transporting myself back to like who I was then yeah. and like what I was thinking and feeling then because I do feel so differently now. I think when we reconciled to jump ahead, I ultimately came to a place where I was like, I was the person in privilege that wasn't willing to do what needed to be done for my friend. Yeah. Do I think there were, which we've also talked about Just other dynamics other in, our friendships. in our friendship. Totally. totally. But that's why I had to wait three and a half years, even when I was so out of the church, fully started this podcast yeah. until I was finally okay to be like, no, it was just wrong. But I think it's worth speaking to where I was because I know there's yeah. a lot of people who listen to the podcast who are either like teetering or on yeah, the cusp or whatever. Totally. And like, no, yeah, I would love this. I think <laughs> for so long, like when you first came out to me and we had that conversation in the courtyard, I remember another conversation in the front yard at Becca Neal's house. I remember saying like, it's not real. Like you're not going to go to hell. Yeah. Totally. And I believed that. Yeah. And I remember like I also remember that. when we had our fight in the garden in San Francisco, at that point, my belief system really truly was I'm Mormon because there are things about Mormonism that I believe, but I really truly do not yeah. believe this part of it. I knew that. I wanted you to be like, okay, you're a Mormon, but you don't believe this part of it, the part of it that has harmed me, et cetera, et cetera. But I understand now like, that's not really real. <laughs> yeah. And it was my experience. I think for me, it was real at the time. And I think it was a stepping stone that like had to happen for me. I think so much of what was coming up for me too was like, quite frankly, just like pride. I had been a good Mormon. I had done the good Mormon <sighs> things. And I was so determined to be a progressive Mormon. I was so triggered by you yeah. because I was like, don't make me face the ultimate ultimatum yeah. of being Mormon. Don't yeah. make me face it because I want to have my cake and eat it too. I want to yeah. be Mormon and also say I'm an ally. I'm Mormon, but my best friend's queer and I love and support them. Of course, they're not going to hell, but it's like, what do the books say, babe? Yeah. What are the people Where's that your tithing you're, going? Yes. What are yeah. the people that you're worshiping saying? Like it is intertwined. It is. And I was trying so hard to, separate, to separate it. Yeah. And I thought I was doing the best thing I could do, which was to like, essentially Still preach to you yeah. like you won't go to hell yeah you can leave the church and be fine and then you're like well then you leave the church bitch yeah. and like yeah. i was thinking about that too last night because i was just realizing yet again not that i haven't realized this previously but like it's not fair it's not okay to say i'm mormon i i don't think you know if you're gay go live your life do your thing you should be happy okay, then why are you still Mormon? Like those yeah. things really don't. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Totally. I mean, like to illustrate this thing, we have some other friends who I won't name. We were talking about this queerness. They're also like progressive, like half in, half out now. Mm. I was like, if your kid was gay, would you leave? And they were like, oh yeah, absolutely. And I'm like, but you, you can say that you would leave the church if your kid was gay, but you're not leaving right now because you don't have a gay kid. You can understand how fucked up it would be as a parent 
to be in the church and raise a queer kid inside the church or have a queer kid and still remain in the church. But just because it's not fucking smacking you in the fucking face and your kid's not on the verge of suicide, you don't have to do that. You're going to stay. I think once again, this overarching thing of like, what? Like, it's like a gaslight thing to be like, totally. You would leave if your kid was gay because you know, that's insane, but you don't have a gay kid. So you're not going to leave. What about that's Also, what about all the other gay kids? Too. Right. Like, just what about, because it's not your actual. What about your fucking cousin? Exactly. Or who? Your cousin who maybe did kill themselves. Yes. Like, or your friend, or your yeah. brother, or 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 totally. or the person. Maybe your kid is gay, and you don't know yet. Totally. A hundred percent. I think like that. Really, for so many people who do leave, and so many people on the cusp, that's got to be where the rubber really hits the road. Yeah. It's like not only like if your kid was or anything, but it's like I could have been you. I just, I wasn't just different dice, but I could have been. And like, why is it fair then for the person who didn't end up being you to just get to stay? 100%. And I think the other element I want to speak to here, and I do not use this word lightly is brainwashing. Yeah. I think for me, I'm kind of make peace, honestly, using that word because I actually feel like I was brainwashed and like, I think the brainwashing for me was so deep and so insidious because I thought that I wasn't brainwashed in this way of like everything the prophet says is true. I am robot for church, but I was brainwashed almost in a more subtle and scary way because I was like, no, I think for myself, I'm making my own rules. I'm allowed to like forge my own path within Mormonism, but I was brainwashed into thinking I couldn't actually leave Mormonism, the Mormon church. And you and I have talked about this, like people that will say like, yeah, you know, I don't agree with everything, but I still choose to stay for X, Y, Z. And it's like, if you were a member of any other religion and they started preaching something that you were like, oh, that's really harmful and scary and wrong you would leave that religion and go find one that aligned with you. Yep. What in my mind makes it cultish or is that you will remain even if you're completely against a core tenant, completely against a core tenant of the church that they continue to preach that continues to perpetuate very real, very, very real harm. Yeah. But you, you justify it. Yeah. And I was so deep in it that I was justifying and justifying. And then I got so almost, my new dogma was my justifications. No, I am an ally. And how dare anyone tell me I'm not? Yeah. That was my new dogma. And it's like, well, ask the people you're apparently an ally to. Yeah. Is this really allyship? Totally. And Oh, fascinating. Yeah. Oof. So I feel like... No, it's terrifying. It's really scary. And, and I think there's an element of it too. Like there was codependency. Yeah. And I think I needed to almost take a step away to be able to like think straight enough almost to just like make my own decision, which was ultimately to leave. Yeah. And like not that long after. Yes. I do think that that is why I think progressive Mormonism can be more scary in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I, I hesitate sometimes to talk about it so severely because I also think a lot of times that space is a stepping stone. Yeah, totally. So it gets a little complicated, but all of that to say that was the space I was occupying. And even though it was a step on my journey, it still caused serious harm. Yeah. Actual harm to you. Totally. Like, a, you know, I think that's like me as a person, yes. not just like the greater gay, not the or community. Like, no, like I was like Tanner was like hurt by people that I loved most. Exactly. And like their continued devotion to this hate group. Exactly. That excluded me. And like the church is built uh, it's very base against queer people. If you are a part of the church, you are saying, I accept that the church is built against women, queer people, and um, people of color. Once again, maybe a lot of people listening to this aren't ready for that, but I don't know how to like not sugarcoat that. Yeah. Because that's... No, I think it's important you speak to it and you speak to it the way that you have. And I appreciate you speaking to it that way. It's not a fun thing to hear, obviously, yeah, totally. when you're like in the place I was. Totally. And... And that is like kind of the like conversations we were having. Where exactly. It's like that's not going to come across well. Totally. To you. Even if my intentions are nice, I'm not calling you a bitch. Like that's, I'm shaking your worldview and saying like you are wrong. Yeah. And anybody would be defensive. You're that type of defense mechanism is turned on in any sort of situation. Totally. Similar. Well, that's why I think like our situation was 
I don't want to say like doomed, but even when you, I mean, speaking a little bit more to the dynamic, which we like touched on in a lighthearted way with like competition and yeah. like pride, like I didn't want to be wrong yeah, totally. and you don't want to be wrong about something you've given everything to everything. And so I was like, okay, I found the perfect way. I'm going to not be entirely wrong, but I'm also going to be like, an ally and be able to be supportive. And that was the hard truth that like took me a really long time to unravel. And I don't know, I wish there was a magic formula for that's why like you and I talk about this too, even with the girls camp podcast, I know that there are like active Mormons who listen to my podcast, which hell yeah. Great. Is really also like kind of surprising to me. I'm like, I haven't got you yet. (laughs) Yeah. I must not be as persuasive as I think I am, (laughs) but not that that's my point is to persuade people out. It's, it's actually not just because like, I don't find that like a fulfilling mission, Yeah. but I do think a part of my mission is to have enough conversations with enough different people who have enough different viewpoints and enough different stories that hopefully there can be kind of a clearer picture, Totally. whether they've left or they're not a part of it or whatever. And I guess all this just to say, I also want to speak to one other thing too, which is for so long, even with the podcast, I still, and this is why I even still waited to reach out to you. I would still find like some things you said about the church abrasive. Totally. And I wanted Which to, will, I'm sure, like truly going to sound that way to totally, a lot of your listeners. Totally. And yeah. it, it took me a while to be like, that's fine. Even if I still found some of your thoughts or your approach to how you spoke about the church abrasive, who the fuck cares? Yeah. A, that doesn't mean we can't be friends. Totally. Also B, like, what do I find abrasive about it? What does that bring up for me? Like, I guess just realizing like different people are going to speak about it differently, of course, and as they should. Yeah. And of course, I mean, even that is kind of, I'm realizing crazy to say like, oh, it's maybe people will find you abrasive in a different way. Like a fucking course. Yeah. Look what you gave up for it that I didn't. Look yeah. at what you suffered for it that I didn't. Yeah. So you deserve to be angry. You deserve yeah. to be abrasive if you want to be. Yeah. Like, I mean, you are from also a privileged space. Exactly. But not, I mean, you're still a woman. Sure. You, but like. But in large part, I'm totally. able to be that way because yeah. of my experience with the church, because I didn't deny a fundamental piece of myself for yeah. 25 years. And you like know? how many like women are killing themselves because they're like excluded from the church. I'm sure there are, but like but it's di- not it's how it's affecting thing. the queer community exactly. and like suicide rates and mental health and eating disorders within like. Totally. Yeah. It's yeah, you're right. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. So anyway, I, I'm so sad that that had to happen. I'm so sorry. As I've said many times, I want to say that like again, publicly so many times, I really am so sorry. It's, it's such a sad thing. And I think in the same breath that it gives me in one sense, like a sympathy and an understanding for people in that space because it was me. It also gives me like a rage and a passion to like shed light on and like maybe push people a little bit out of that space, you know? Totally. Totally. I, I've accepted your apology a million times over. (laughs) I would not be here. Um, You're like, actually, I don't. I'm like, actually, I want to take this, (laughs) this moment to publicly tell you to go to fucking hell, bitch. (laughs) Hell is actually real and you're going to outer darkness um, with me and all my daddies. Honestly, Fun. outer darkness sounds like a rave. Yeah. Oh my God. Do we ha- do we start a queer rave called outer Please. darkness? I mean, I've been in enough dark rooms to kind of get the picture. Yeah, I think um, you'd be well suited for that person. <laughs> do we, that's the new post-Mormon rave. 100%. I'm obsessed. Okay. Free heroin shots. Just kidding. Um... No, heroin's bad. <laughs> heroin's very bad. And meth, also and meth. We always confirmed. we are scared of both heroin and meth. That yeah. is something that nobody who does drugs ever fucks with. But thank you for saying that. Um, I obviously accepted your apology already, and I love you. And that is so crazy because years later, you're my best friend again. Mm. And I, when you broke up with me, I was I just moved to a different space, and we talked about this as well. I actually want to. I kind of want to narrate our coming back together because I want to like narrate all the things you did right in my mind. We had enough space to re-meet each other as new people. Mm -hmm. And I I had really, I've done a lot of therapy. I've calmed the fuck down. I've had plenty amounts of sex. The church once again is Bernstein Bears to me. I 
I've, I've done a lot of work. It's had a lot of things have transpired, relationships, times, work, job, whatever. Enough buffering from my situation in the church. My health has gotten better. My digestive system and my breathing system are back in order. But yeah, so we like re-met each other, right, as new people, and we're able to reformulate a new relationship together that has been so lovely and so beautiful and I think stronger than any relationship we ever had in the past. Yeah. But this happened when both of us were ready, which we were very on very different timelines. You reached out a year prior to us getting back together. I wasn't ready. I still like, I really felt like once again, it was the beginning of COVID. I just moved to LA. I just left the church. I didn't have a friend group here. You were still in touch with all of our other friends. That was really hard for me to be basically ostracized from the group as the one who had left the church other than Jackie. And I had to like reformulate new friends, a new community, a new family. I could not see you post things, could not hear your voice because I was just ultimately heartbroken. Mm -hmm. And that's when we jumped on our FaceTime. Remember like you are like one of two people in this whole world that can make me cry. (laughs) Seriously. Like reserved for the closest family. And I, you just like fucking broke my heart. And that's like basically like all like even church aside, the church was the impetus for this to happen for us. I think the biggest one, but like you broke my fucking heart and that was so painful. And it's so insane that so many years later, like we can be stronger than ever. Mm. And that's because, which here's where all the good things about you (laughs) and less good things about you. I'm obsessed with you. You're the best. You're the smartest and most wise. And also, killing it on girls camp. do we break the fourth wall and talk about how fucking cunty this podcast is and how like well thought and how wise and k- kind and smart you're doing with this it's incredible i'm such a huge fan that means the most coming and from you it. thanks um but you reached out you said like i we had dm'd about a song or like about that shirt I DM'd about that the flag book shirt and the book and the book yeah I damned um, you out crying of literally H-mark. nowhere. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And you're like, sorry for the jump scare. And I'm like, I'm literally at Spirit Halloween right now. Um, and anyway, in this text, you were like, I don't know where you're at with this, but all I know is that like life is very short and I miss you and I love you and I would love to reconnect with you. This last text was kind of like, I'm an adult, you're an adult. Like, do we want to do this? Like, if you want to do this, I'm open to like try this. Mm. And I was like, okay. Like, let's fucking do this. Like, and I sent you a few voice memos. Mm -hmm. And I was like, just so you know, this is not going to be easy for me. You broke my fucking heart. (laughs) And I am not sure I'm going to be able to get everything out that I need need to say to you in one session. Um, Are you down to talk? And you immediately texted me back and were like, just so you know, I'm coming at this knowing that I was in the wrong. And like, you were like, there's plenty of things that also like informed our breakup that I don't feel the need to rehash, but like, I love you. I want to like take credit for what I did to you. And I sat on my laptop and I listed these specific moments, hot tub moment, the conversation on the phone and kind of the, like the weaponization of people that we had talked about or how that would, I had perceived that that way. And you basically just like took everything <laughs> you really did. And like, that is, such a different Haley than I knew. And the first one was good too, but like this one was, was so very much more intent evolved. on being very, very, very right. Yeah. All the time. Totally. Yeah. And I never won an argument, even when I'm like, <laughs> I said like black was black and you're like, no, it's literally white. Um, <laughs> in my entire life, which is why I'm obsessed with you. And actually once again, going to propose at the end of this se- uh, section. Um, but I just remember being like, wow, like this is somebody who can like literally take credit for like how they hurt me. And you were like, I'm I'm sure this is not going to be fun to hear, but like, I please give me it all. Mm. Um, which is what I say to um, somebody about to enter me. <laughs> to the daddies. Um, yeah, literally. <laughs> um, and it was insane. Like you literally just like listened to me, like literally like shit talk you to your face about like how bad you would hurt me. And like how I saw your character flaws come into play with the church and like how you victimized yourself when I didn't feel like you need to be victimized and how you ostracized me on purpose from our friends and how, how I perceived that. No, that's, that's a tricky one for all based up on, on like of who's perceiving what, mm. but I, you just took accountability for everything and you just apologized. And it was, 
insane how like kind of quickly thereafter we were just like back into it because <laughs> like we were always destined to be girls of course and family and we always were even when we weren't talking like i hated you so much because i loved you so yeah. deeply still i yeah thought about you every day cared about you so yeah. much yeah so thank many you missed songs um, thank you for saying so many that. missed spotify links <laughs> yeah. but um i was so impressed and even when i was like you said this thing and your pot in your tiktok that like i was the one that mm. did this i was like you left me out to dry bitch like this was not my doing and you were like okay like that's not how i perceived it i can totally see how that like you just like really accepted everything and that's basically all you could have done you know what i mean like you can't change the past i can't change the past we can't change the scary fucking cult that we escaped from but what you can do is like admit fault if you've made fall and even if you don't understand the fault you've made like listening to people who you've harmed in the past and then like reformulating what the future looks like and right when we got back together we were like let's move forward right like let's we're not gonna have we don't need to have what we had in the past we don't want what we had in the Mm -hmm. past like how do we go forward as best friends in like such a different place and like move on from our scary origins and I just like want to applaud you I I mean I just think how hypocritical would it be for me to like even have this podcast if I'm still like, well, the church made me do it. Or like, I just think so much of the journey of leaving Mormonism, hopefully for people is like, you're going to be wrong a lot. We were really wrong. I was really wrong for a lot of my life. And yeah, it's different when that's like theoretical. Like I was wrong about what I believed about heaven versus like my wrong beliefs about heaven, like really impacted like someone I love most it's different, but I also think like that has to be, you know, it's, yeah, it just is hypocritical to me. And I didn't even read it as like, I just felt like what you were saying was like true and honest. And also I think the difference at that point was you were coming from a place of like, I need to tell you this so we can move forward. Yeah. Like you weren't trying to hurt me. You were just like, this is how I feel. I have to be able to say these yeah. things. And I was like, of course, like, yeah. I want to be able to hear those things. Like you deserve that after what you went through. And so it didn't feel like, you know, just like gratuitous, like you sucked so bad. I was just like, yeah, this was your experience. Like you should be able to share that. And I think even though I do feel like I was, you know, the one that needed to take it on the chin because of the circumstances, I found it healing too, because I feel like I was able to finally let rest like such a big piece of me that I was like, so, ashamed of and like so um you know like I said I I understand who I was then I understand why I was that way I don't think I was like some hostile scary person but or and (laughs) I also like did do some kind of scary things under certain influences totally whether or not you know whatever all that to say, I'm so glad. <laughs> it yeah. like really feels like a piece of life just has like shifted back into its rightful place. If you felt the universe shifting for the better about six months Those ago. Those were our tectonic plates that was, touching again. <laughs> yeah. I literally was just about to say the same thing funny. of like, we were never meant to not be friends. Mm. Like I don't, you know, like I believe very different things now, but like there's so many things that would make us not friends seeing as like I like I could make a long list and like we're always meant to be my girl and I like have always felt that's why we've like gone through so many like fucked up family things and dramas and deaths and like so many different iterations of our friendship and different times and seasons for us and like we were always meant to be together and of course once again there's other factors but like the church ruined our relationship yeah and like broke us apart based off of like core values of who we were of what you believed and who I was and vice versa. And that is illegal. That's against the law. Jail. (laughs) That's jail to have broken us up. If you haven't left the church yet, that should be reason. Yeah. 100%. (laughs) And tonight we're going to toast it. I'm taking you to a concert and we're going to a rooftop and you're going to meet some of my babies and we're going to cheers to coming back together forever. Cheers to that. Do you Cheers, have any more? Baby, yes. I've got some ice left. Cheers. Cheers. I love you so much. Thank love you. love you so much. You're going to come back soon because we have so much more lore so to dig much. into, especially with like your, we didn't even, we, we didn't, didn't even, even scratch the surface. But also so many more funny things to talk about. So many more funny. Mm. People are probably like, we don't give a shit about Nate Sherman no, we in third grade. Don't care. I mean like they will. <laughs> or Brett, F- they Brett will. Fisher in fifth. <laughs> Brett Fisher, bitch. No. Or the Taylor next Roy. <laughs> no, Taylor 
no wow there's a lot <laughs> yes i'll be back bitch. i love you thank love you for you. coming and thank you everyone for listening bye g i r l s